Good evening. My name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a medium-sized tech company in Silicon Valley. Previously, I was a financial analyst and financial journalist, and I also worked in research and development in telecommunications. And tonight, I'd like to speak to you about uh, the Ukraine situation and the West's decision to arm the Ukraine to hold off the Russian attack. I'm not gonna get into the historical factors, particularly tonight. Uh, suffice it to say that we can give a little bit of background on that. Um, and to do that, what I really wanna do is go backwards. And, uh, so this was the election in 2010 um, in terms of alignment of the pro-Russian candidate versus the pro-Western candidate, Yanukovych and Timoshenko. This is an ethnic breakdown of the Ukraine. Um, so in terms of the hardcore ethno-nationalist uh, uh, Ukraine, uh, that area is concentrated uh, up in these oblasts or, or states of the Ukraine. Um, and the um, areas that are more uh, Russo-Ukrainian are these light yellow um, and yellow areas. And then uh, strongly Rus or, uh, Russian is Crimea. Uh, and uh, we see this in interviews that the, um, the people are most uh, oriented towards uh, being at least a substantial minority uh, uh, pro-separatist in these eastern states uh, and a little bit more ambiguity in these lighter tinted states. And there would probably be fierce, ongoing organic partisan resistance in these red areas, depending on what would happen in the post-occupation area. And I saw today a uh, British general, former general being interviewed, who thought that once Russia had achieved getting to the Donetsk border, that they would likely halt and that the Ukrainians should have to get used to the fact that Kherson, Zaporozhye, and uh, uh, I'm sorry, here's Kherson, here's Zaporozhye, and uh, Donetsk, and Luhansk, and parts of Kharkiv would be under Russian occupation as a de facto policy. So, of course, uh, the uh, those who um, would explain the Russian position, would state that the coup in 2014 uh, or the, um, the overthrow of the Yanukovych government and the replacement of it with uh, Yatsenyuk, uh, who is the US's preferred replacement, who was not elected by the people initially. It was an election and this is billionaire Poroshenko won. And Poroshenko took the Ukraine from having a functional army of about 6,000 people and drove it to an army of 250,000, including reserves, 750,000. So basically we saw a massive expansion of the Ukrainian army. And um, to give you an idea, both the German and uh, uh, British armed forces are under 100,000 men. So Ukraine had built an army uh, as big as Britain and Germany combined under a vociferously anti-Russian um, ideology. Uh, and so, uh, you know, obviously most people think that uh, there's a lot of things you should try before you roll tanks on your neighbor. Uh, and uh, we'll see what history has to say about that. So um, the real thing that concerns me is, um, the potential madness of arming the Ukraine if they can't win uh, with losses of 100 to 1,000 people a day and um, possibly over a billion dollars in damage a day. Um, it seems like if this is uh, fruitless, um, you know, who would want to know that they died in vain? Um, and we have to figure out and face what does that mean? So um, the basic argument of uh, international uh, realists is that uh, 
Ukraine is a vital national interest in Russia. It's a huge nation right on its border and belly. So we can just look here at this map that I clicked out. Now, as long as we're on the subject of the, um, the politics of feeding this war to a successful conclusion for the Ukraine, uh, what I depicted here are the nations that are dark uh, gray-blue are fierce opponents of uh, Russia in this matter. Ukraine is, is uncolored because it should be a split, but you might as well consider Ukraine one of those nations. Um, so all the nations basically directly on Russia's European border. And then there are the uh, Orthodox uh, Christian countries, Bulgaria and Serbia are two that are uh, the populations are more pro-Russian, which I tinted as orange, uh, uh, as countries uh, sizable uh, pro-Russian minorities, if nothing else. And then the yellow countries are, are, are uh, less um, uh, militaristic in their approach, are less willing to, they're, they're more looking for a negotiated settlement in my view. And then the, you know, the second tier of opposition are the France, Germany, Spain, Czech Republic, uh, Slovakia, Norway, Sweden, Finland in this particular map. Um, and then you have these light yellow countries in Africa that voted uh, for the um, uh, for the uh, uh, sanctioning of Russia over the uh, Ukraine invasion. Um, and then the orange countries are countries that uh, uh, were absent or voted uh, absent or abstained. Um, and um, some of, and then I marked Mali as a Russian ally. Eritrea did vote no, Syria voted no. Turkey is a, a, an interesting key man here, being both in NATO and sort of a non aligned state um, in this two world order. It's sort of trying to uh, play both sides. These Central Asian states and, uh, and Iran are nominally Russian allies. Um, and I just marked the various states green that are sort of developing countries um, that are largely neutral in the affair. So uh, when you look at who could bring uh, weapons to bear on Russia in the overall scheme here, it doesn't look uh, particularly encouraging. Um, so let's look at these militaries for a moment. So here we have just a comparison of Russia versus Ukraine. And I'm sure that there are inaccuracies in this site and we can drill down at this, this global firepower site. Um, but it's interesting the way that I've seen them adjust uh, some factors. So I'm not sure it's completely out of whack. So here we show the Ukraine as it compared to Russia population, 142 million versus 43 million. However, in fact, the more of Ukraine Russia occupies, the more population is in their base and the more Ukraine shrinks. So I would say Ukraine is already at closer to 32 million people they actually have in their territories that they um, uh, can recruit from. And the Russians are closer to 145 million. I can show that later. But you know, as Russia came, to, the reason Russia wants to obtain territory in the Ukraine uh, on a simple uh, sheer power level is that the more of the Ukraine that they control, the less uh, population is available in the Ukrainian army to recruit. Um, so uh, moving down the line here, when we get into um, defense budget, it's very curious that they show that Russia has 154 billion defense funds, really 50 billion. So they obviously worked on that figure a bit, but regardless, whether it's 150 or 50, um, uh, the defense budgets are obviously clearly different. Although now the US is going to give virtually unlimited funds to the Ukraine, but it doesn't solve the problem of uh, whether we can actually manufacture this gear and the quantities needed to fight Russia. So in the case of aircraft, we have 4,000 versus 300, fighter aircraft 772 versus 69, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And what we really get into some crazy numbers because these the Ukrainians can be beefed up to several hundred fighter aircraft, to 
of several hundred tanks, close to a thousand, close to a thousand in artillery and in rocket systems. But the numbers that Russia has are 12,000 tanks, uh, uh, 6,000 self-propelled artillery. Uh, and this uh, Ukrainian number is probably half of this right now, uh, but there is new Western equipment coming in. But what's being promised, 10 of this, 20 of that, when what's needed is thousands. And um, uh, that, that simply can't be manufactured quickly enough to make any difference. By the time it gets there, Russia will have broken through. And here we have mobile rocket projectors, 4,000 versus 500. So uh, then we say, well, okay, that's against the Ukraine. What about against uh, England, for example? What if England simply transfers all their weapons to the Ukraine or even got directly into the fight? And obviously England has been complaining about their uh, state of readiness for such a conflict lately. Um, but if you look at the case of England, uh, fighter aircraft, 100 versus 700. Um, you look at helicopters, 1,500 versus 200. Uh, tanks, 12,000 versus 200. Uh, Self-prepared artillery, 6,500 versus 89. Code artillery, 7,500 versus 126. And mobile rocket projectors, 4,000 versus 40. And you look at the size of the armed forces itself, active personnel. Well, this is interesting. Here we're seeing 194,000 uh, versus uh, 850,000 in the Russian armed forces. And uh, so the only country to really get close uh, is like to look at this list here where I've sorted them just on tanks. Um, and you see, you know, Ukraine's down here because it had a lot of tanks, but uh, you, uh, you, Ukraine is, is exponentially outgunned by Russia. And um, so uh, getting back to my talk, Why is the war being decided as an artillery battle? Well, Russia has a very formidable air defense. It even claims that it can shoot down supersonic weapons, which we don't even have yet. They also have supersonic weapons, which can hit all the way into Europe, uh, even to London. Uh, they take uh, they travel at five thousand miles an hour. They take uh, you know ten minutes to get across Europe to London. Uh, for example, and they can, so they can strike all of these arms shipments as they come into the country, training areas and so forth. Um, and um, they can't really use their, if they use their tanks, they're going to have casualties because tanks are vulnerable to portable, man trade any tank weapons are uh, vulnerable to artillery. And um, the, the Ukrainians have perfect uh, intelligence really in terms of being able to use our, the satellite imagery of NATO um, to inform them about tank positions. Uh, so artillery is, is a long range weapon um, and missile systems are even longer. Range. So at the moment, um, Russia has, um, uh, and also uh, Russia is trying not to uh, create huge amounts of civilian casualties. Um, and these cities are held by urban warriors that hold out for days or weeks, uh, preventing um, ability to, um, to defeat the enemy without um, incurring massive civilian casualties. You just try to use raw firepower. So the method of choice has been artillery to minimize Russian casualties because these are long range weapons. The Russians have a huge advantage in, in terms of numbers. Uh, so, you know, what I wonder is why don't we see on the news a, a proper mathematical analysis? Uh, the only possible way the Ukrainians could um, start to turn the tide would be with uh, uh, sufficient quantities of long range missile systems to destroy the Russian artillery. And um, the Russians are going to be bombing those systems as they move towards the front if they can find them. Um, and uh, the Russians also have missile systems of their own. Um, so even if the West achieved parity with Russia over missile systems, there would still be this huge 
uh, uh, asymmetry in the artillery. So the West would have to overwhelm the Russians in missile systems. Uh, and that would be you know, a, the kind of question that should be being asked. Otherwise, you know, we are basically asking the Ukrainians to just throw themselves up against a hail of steel and perish. Um, so in all of these different you know, military comparisons, uh, the only country that could defeat Russia on paper really is the United States using its air force. And that's a question of Russian um, anti-aircraft uh, systems against American air force and what would happen when you combine the two. And it would be an incredibly expensive affair because US uh, fighter uh, aircraft is you know, probably $100 million a, a plane. Uh, so, you know, just a day where you lost 50 planes, uh, you know, that would be $5 billion uh, in a day, you know. Uh, so, uh, what we, you know, what we're seeing here is we're seeing a large scale conventional war occur between nuclear powers, effectively. Um, and that's because uh, nobody has to go nuclear yet. Uh, but there's no way that Ukraine can defeat Russia. And this should have been. Uh, determined, uh, you know, at least six weeks ago. And reading too much into the initial Russian chaotic entry in Ukraine, uh, you know, it's a huge mistake. It's like somebody buying a speculative investment because of momentum. Um, you know, no decent financial analyst would ever recommend somebody buy an overvalued speculative investment in the same way no decent financial military analyst would have recommended uh, uh, funneling large amounts of weapons to Ukraine once this Russian tactic uh, had been deployed, which is essentially um, unanswerable on the Ukrainian side because we do not have the manufacturing capacity to bring in the amount of rocket systems that would be needed by the Ukraine, which would be in the hundreds. Um, and that would be the next thing to look at is to look at these rocket systems. So um, one other slide I wanted to share with you tonight is just looking at you know, uh, the, the opposition to Russia in Europe. Um, so you know, this is an interesting slide that tells you a lot about why there is still some curious uh, resistance to uh, completely tossing Russia out. And these gray countries weren't hold for Orthodox at all. But we see that Yugoslavia, Northern Macedonia, Serbia, and Montenegro, and Romania and Bulgaria have substantial Orthodox populations, as well as, of course, Russia, uh, George, uh, Armenia, um, and um, uh, yeah, but basically just uh, Armenia. So this is an area that's going to be difficult to turn against Russia. And of course, here in this, we see the very bottom, Syria uh, has an Orthodox Christian population. This is an interesting map uh, showing the area that was uh, allocated to the Ukraine by Lenin at the end of World War uh, I and the um, consolidation of power by the USSR during after the Civil War. Um, and this is the area that appeared when uh, Putin ironically said, oh, you guys want to decommunize? OK, well, why stop halfway? We'll help you go all the way there. So he was hinting, really, I think, that this whole area is being contested. So um, I highly recommend everybody contact their congressperson and the White House and recommend that we come up with a satisfactory solution here that doesn't involve 100 to 1,000 people a day dying. Uh, there, because I don't see a mathematical proof here. And I don't mean to have a dog in the fight. My name is Alexander Hagen. Good night and good luck.